Hi everyone, uh, this is video, a video about how we study the expression of genes. So we've talked about how important it is uh, that genes are expressed at certain times, under certain conditions, uh, in a certain tissues, um, and, but we haven't talked about how we actually get at that. We've just sort of said this gene is expressed then, um, but here we want to start to talk about general strategies for this. So the first thing to note is that when we're talking about uh, gene expression, we could study at various levels, right? Uh, for a gene to be expressed, there has to be an RNA made. So we could look at the level of RNA in the cell, when the RNA is there, how much there is. Or we could look at the rate at which that RNA is translated, because that's going to give us the rate at which protein is made. Um, or we could look at the overall level of protein, because we talked about uh, ubiquitin and degradation. Proteins are not forever. Uh, and different proteins are degraded at different rates. Um, so another thing we could do would be look at directly at the protein level. So since what we mostly care about here, or what's, gonna, um, what's going to determine gene function is going to be the overall level of protein, you might ask, why don't we study this? And, and the question is, in large part, many times, because it's harder to do. Um, when we get into sequencing technologies, I think today, um, we'll talk about sequencing of RNAs and DNAs, um, which is now quite straightforward, uh, but, but sequencing proteins or, or really getting systematically of proteins takes a lot, um, a lot more time and energy. Okay, so in order to do any of this, what we need to do is to detect the molecule, right? This is sort of like with PCR, we were saying um, that among this sea of chromosomes, the sea of genes, we want to focus in on one. So we have a similar problem here, right? We need to detect a single molecule or a single type of molecule among a whole cell full of different molecules. Um, so the general strategy for detecting the molecules basically looks like this. So we have some molecule of interest. Um, and then to that molecule of interest, we're going to have a grabber, right? We have to have something that um, binds specifically to the, mo uh, the molecule of interest, right? So that that we have some way of interfacing with the molecule of interest. Okay, so here it's just a square, but if this were a specific DNA sequence or a specific protein with specific structure, um, then what we want it, we need something that will specifically bind to that structure. Okay, so, so now we've, we've got something that will actually bind to our molecule of interest, um, but we don't yet know, now, now we have, in some ways we have just the same problem again, right? Because we have our molecule of interest, and now we have our grabber, but how do we know whether the grabber has grabbed? And so what we're going to do is add to that um, some sort of detectable signal. So often that's radioactivity that can be detected, um, or it's fluorescence that can be seen. Um, and so then we're good, together we're going to call this a probe, because it's going to allow us to probe for our molecule of interest. Okay, so here's our general strategy. Here's our biological sample. Um, so in this case, we don't have our molecule of interest. That'll come in in a moment. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to add our probe. We just add a whole bunch of our probe. And then we're going to give our probe time for the grabber to grab the molecule. So, but in this case, there's no molecule of interest. Um, and so the grabber, these molecules, as I've drawn them, I intend them to be different molecules. Um, so our grabber has got nothing to grab. Um, and so we're going to then, if we wash off our probe, we give our probe some time to bind, um, and then we're going to wash it off. And only if the probe has bound to a certain molecule will it remain. Otherwise, it's going to wash off. Um, so if we do this with a biological sample with no molecule of interest, we add the probe, um, and then we uh, give it some time, and then we wash it off, and it doesn't bind, so we do not see any probe, no radioactivity, or no fluorescence. If we do have the molecule of interest, now we add the probe. Some of the probe binds to our molecule of interest. We wa wash off the extra probe, uh, and we're left with some radioactivity with some fluorescence. Um, okay, so, so then our question becomes basically, uh, how do we make a grabber? Okay, so um, for a known RNA or DNA sequence, if we know the sequence that we want to detect, this is relatively e easy, right? Because we can use complementarity um, to, to design a grabber, right? If we want to go after an RNA, we can make a complementary sequence, or a DNA, we can make a complementary sequence. 
So it's fairly straightforward to know how to make a, a grabber that will specifically grab our sequence of interest. So for proteins, it's relatively hard. And, and by hard, I mean it's, it's quite possible now, um, but it costs a substantial amount of money. It can cost quite a lot of time. And so the way we can do this, for those of you who have uh, taken immunology, um, we can develop antibodies, even if you haven't taken immunology. Uh, we can develop these immunological antibodies, um, which basically exploit the immune system um, to develop these response molecules that will bind to the, the molecule of interest. So we challenge immune cells with a molecule of interest, and they create antibodies, grabbers, for that specific sequence. Um, okay, so one of these cases in, is in situ hybridization. Um, so in situ meaning in site and hybridization meaning we're going to use a probe that will hybridize to things. So here we have a known mRNA sequence. Um, and so we're going to design a probe. Okay, so it's going to be in DNA because DNA is more stable and easy to work with, uh, easier to synthesize. Um, so we're going to use a DNA probe that's going to hybridize to the sequence. Okay, and then we're going to add to that a fluorescing molecule. So here is our grabber in this case, or our, our, our probe, um, and it's going to come in and bind to the sequence. And so this is an example of how this works. Um, so these are two students from Karen Crow's lab, um, and they've been working on um, trying to determine expression of these developmentally important genes called Hox genes um, in the origins of novel structures. Um, so they're looking in paddlefish, there's this um, additional uh, structure, I've forgotten its name right now, um, that they're interested in seeing whether these Hox genes exp are, are expressed in the structure or not. So that's what we're looking at here. Um, and so these are each in situ hybridizations to one gene. So this is to a gene called Hox 11A, Hox 13 alpha, Hox D12 alpha, Hox 13 alpha. And so here, for instance, you can see expression of D13 um, at the end of the, of the paddlefish appendage. And so similarly down here, we're studying a second appendage, and we can see expression. This, this is dark, the dark purple here indicates binding probe. Okay, so um, another thing we can do is, so, so that's how we study expression of mRNAs. What if we actually want to go directly after the protein? Okay, so we said here um, that we can use antibody formation. So if this is our target protein, we can use immune cells uh, to produce primary antibodies. It actually gets a little bit more complicated. We, we use a secondary uh, antibody to the first, but we won't worry about those details right now. Um, and then here we have, of course, our detectable thing. So again, same strategy you can see. Uh, we have a primary antibody, or our, we have a grabber, that's going to grab our molecule of interest, and that's integrated into a probe. Um, and so the, then the way this works is we'll take our whole cell sample, um, we'll run it out on a gel. So this is a gel similar to the gel electrophoresis gels that we talked about, um, and uh, or some sort of a membrane. And then we can just we can blot with this antibody to show us whether or not the protein is present. Okay, so. That's the way that we can kind of non-invasively study things. Um, that basically we can go in without manipulating the organism. We can just go in and sense what's in the organism. Um, so another way we can do it is actually with using transgenics. And this is going to be a trick using the green fluorescent protein, or GFP. So this is this tiny little protein. Its structure is over here. Um, that is produced in a jellyfish. So it's, it's uh, natively produced in a jellyfish. Again, it evolved in a specific organism, and now we're going to exploit it to use it in the lab. Um, and so this is a tiny little compact protein, and what we can do is we can take the sequence that codes for this gene, and we can attach it to our, uh, our gene of interest. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to take our gene of interest, so our coding sequence, starting with AUG, etc. Um, and then we're going to take the coding sequence of GFP. So we're going to make a gene, a construct, that are these two DNA sequences together. When that's expressed, what we're going to get is uh, the protein encoded by our gene of interest hooked to a GFP. So we're going to get a joint protein. So this is done 
in the DNA. I was confused when I first learned, learned this. This is done in the GNA, DNA, and then the protein is just expressed by the cell, giving us a compound protein. And so ultimately what that ends up doing is it gives us our protein of interest um, and the GFP together in a single covalently linked kind of normally created protein, right? So it's the gene that's weird, and then the gene gets expressed as, a, as, as normal genes to into a compound protein here. Um, and so because this is visible, um, we can now just see where it is. So this is actually from a study that uh, we're following up on in my laboratory um, in which um, the question is how the C-terminus of a protein is affecting its localization. Um, and I think I won't go into the details of this, though. It's very interesting. Um, uh, I'll put this paper up online. Um, but basically what we're looking at here, the question is whether each of these proteins are expressed in an organelle called the peroxisome or whether they're expressed in the cell itself. So what we're looking at here is um, actually using two different GFP-like molecules. So I think this one is the GFP that's telling us where this protein is in the cell. This is a similar construct of RFP telling us where the peroxisomes are. So for a, it's hooked to a known peroxisomal gene. And what we can see is that they overlap, right? These are in the same positions um, as these are. And down here, we're doing a similar thing with a, a, different, a different gene. Uh, and again, we see co-localization of our protein of interest, um, sorry, our protein of interest with our peroxisomal protein. So the take home here is that we can use GFP and attach it at the DNA level um, into a compound gene, which will then express a compound protein which will then allow us to, to see, to actually physically see without use of a probe where this gene is being expressed. Thanks very much.